our speaker, uh, retired Army Colonel Peter Mansour, who is the Raymond Mason Chair and Professor of Military History here at the Department of History, Ohio State University. Uh, uh, I'm finding a bit of a challenge as um, there's not enough time even to cover the highlights. Uh, he's a graduate of the U U.S. Military Academy. That's not going to keep me. Commander of the 1st Brigade, 1st Armored Division in Iraq from 2003 to 2005. In addition to serving as the Executive of Officer for General Petraeus, he served as Special Assistant to director, the Director of Strategic Planning and Policy at the U.S. Department of Defense. He's a senior military fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, and he has authored two books. The first is Baghdad at Sunrise, and the second is actually titled The Surge, and it is on the surge and his experience working on, on that uh, with, with uh, General Petraeus. Additionally, Pete Mansour is through and through a Buckeye, having earned his MA and PhD degrees right here at Ohio State. Made me very conflicted last week, two weeks ago. <laughs> Sorry about that. I, I was probably the only one on the field who could sing both alma maters legitimately. Yeah. And <laughs> that's, right. that's right. Um, so now, uh, having done our introduction, I'm going to pass the, the chair over um, to Dr. Mansour. Uh, Pete will talk for about 20 or 25 minutes, uh, leaving us plenty of time for questions and observations from the audience. The last question will be taken at 655 firm. This is a, um, uh, a dictate that comes to me from those far above me. Uh, and so um, please don't take offense if we do run out of time at the very end. All right? With that, let me pass the, the, the chair over to you. Well, thanks, Scott. Thanks for that kind introduction. And thank you all for being here uh, this evening um, to talk about what I think is one of the more important uh, national security topics our nation faces the war in Afghanistan, or the longest war in our nation's history. Um, I think we have to go back to understand why we're there, which began with the attack on New York City and in the Pentagon in, on 9-11, 2001. Um, and I think the war since then really breaks down into four major stages. Uh, the first one was about the first six months of the conflict. Uh, which was really a punitive expedition to find those responsible for 9-11 and bring them to justice. And if you think about it in those terms, it really failed. Now, it did punish the Taliban for harboring al-Qaeda and uh, allowing them to use Afghanistan as a, as a base for terror. Uh, but other than uh, removing the Taliban from power, we did not destroy al-Qaeda. It simply moved back uh, through Tora Bora into Pakistan, uh, where it set up shop. Uh, we weren't able to capture Osama bin Laden, the, uh, the mastermind uh, of the raid, uh, of the attacks on 9-11. Uh, and um, he was able to eventually um, establish a residence in Abbottabad near the Pakistani military academy, taken... Um, uh, obviously by uh, the U.S. SEALs in 2011 and um, ended up in a uh, watery, unmarked grave somewhere in the Arabian Sea. So that was the first stage. And there's a lot of people I talk to that say strategically what we should have done is exactly what we did, and then we should have left. Having uh, forced the Taliban from power, we either did or did not get bin Laden, but after that, staying in Afghanistan didn't serve our national interests. There's the more, uh, I think, the larger group of people who say that having forced the Taliban from power, uh, we, the United States, uh, had a responsibility to knit together some sort of uh, Afghanistan that could be an ally in the global war on terror, as it was known at the time and that we could uh, bring the uh, Afghan people into uh, some sort of harmony with the, the way ahead, a way ahead of supposedly a, uh, some sort of representative form of government and uh, some sort of capitalist market economy and so forth. The, uh, the pushback against that has been that that's nation building. It's too hard to do that, you know, if you spend 100 years there um, and uh, $100 billion, you could... Uh, forcefully uh, uh, move Afghanistan from the 13th into the 14th century. 
Um, but uh, there we are trying to do that. So that's the first phase was the punitive expedition. I think the second stage of the Afghan war was an economy of force effort. As the George W. Bush administration's attention turned to Iraq and to removing Saddam Hussein from power. And when, once we invaded Iraq, it became by far the more important uh, geostrategic issue for the United States. Iraq having uh, a lot of oil being positioned in the heart of the Middle East um, next to one of our strategic adversaries, Iran. And, um, and so I think what Admiral Mike Mullen, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, in the mid to late 2000s said was correct. In, in Iraq, we do what we have to and do what we must. And in Afghanistan, we do what we can. And what we could do after all resources were applied to the Iraq war was not very much. Uh, we did convene some loya jurgos, put, put together a constitution for Iraq that I think created a very centralized state uh, which you can probably chime in here, in a land that had never been centralized, that uh, at one point was a monarchy, but with a very loose control of the regions. And so I think what happened is uh, the Loya Jirga um, ended up creating an Afghanistan that was um, ungovernable, ungovernable from the center. Uh, and yet um, that's where we were, and we were trying to... Um, support this government with a minimal amount of, uh, of military forces, maybe 20,000 total. Uh, there were NATO forces involved as well. Um, the United States had a separate command, and the NATO forces had a separate command, and it, it was probably the most convoluted chain of command in the history of warfare. Um, and I know this because I went over there in 2010 when General Petraeus my former boss became head of the mission there in Afghanistan, and we talked about this, and the, the wiring diagram for the military forces over there was unbelievably complex. Um, and I didn't think did us any favors. But from, let's say, 2002 to 2009, you had this period of economy of force, minimal effort applied by the United States, and as a result, it allowed the Taliban uh, and Al-Qaeda as well to make a comeback. They um, set up shop in the federally administered tribal areas in Balut and uh, in, in Quetta, um, in uh, Pakistan. And they were able to uh, regain their strength, uh, re-energize the faithful, uh, get more converts, and start picking away back at Afghanistan. Um, with really, I think, the support of some parts of the Pakistani government, especially the Inter Services Intelligence Agency, the ISI, uh, which viewed Afghanistan as, um, as a secret Indian plot, I think, to surround Pakistan. I think Pakistan's golden age of national security was when the Taliban government was in charge in the 1990s and was uh, loyal to Pakistani um, interests. And so I think there's many in the Pakistani government, regardless of what they say overtly, that uh, really want to go back to that, really would like to see um, uh, Afghanistan once again under Taliban control. And uh, the Haqqani network would be another group that the ISI is supporting. And so this made it um, very difficult for the United States here, Af uh, Pakistan was supposedly an ally in the war on terror. Our supply lines to Afghanistan ran through Pakistani territory, and yet another arm of the Pakistani government was supporting the very people we were fighting. Um, and so this was very, very difficult. By 2009, by the time that uh, Barack Obama came into office as President of the United States, Pakistan was on a downward spiral and the Taliban looked like they were, um, they were potentially uh, going to win if this war continued over the long haul. Now, you might remember that Barack Obama came into office saying basically that he would support more action in Afghanistan, which was the good war 
um, and get out of Iraq, which was the bad war. And so he did. He did surge forces in 2009 and 2010, the beginning of what I would say that is the third stage of the Afghan war, the surge period, 2009 to 2011. And he surged uh, upwards of 80,000 troops into the country. Uh, by the end of that, that period, at the height, we had about 100,000 troops there in Afghanistan. And that's um, the period in which I visited. In December 2010, I went there with Max Boot uh, from the Council on Foreign Relations. And we were uh, shepherded around the country by helicopter, went to Jalalabad in the east, went down to Helmand province in the south, visited the Marines, went to Kandahar, did patrols in the Argandab Valley with uh, the army, kind of made me pine for the good old days of <laughs> wearing body armor and carrying a, a weapon and so forth. Um, a lot of time in Kabul. And um, what I learned from that experience was that uh, where you had sufficient resources, that uh, counterinsurgency could work. But the problem was we didn't have sufficient resources or sufficient time uh, to go beyond the successes that we were having in Helmand and Kandahar. Uh, the, the idea was to spread the campaign north and east as time went on, but time ran out. And the other problem is the, <clears throat> the Taliban could wait us out in his uh, address at West Point announcing the surge. President Obama said, uh, we're going to surge forces, we're going to win this war, and oh, by the way, in 18 months we're going to leave. Uh, we're going to start withdrawing those forces. And that just was completely different than George W. Bush's announcement in uh, 2007 when he said, we're going to surge forces into Iraq, we're going to stay there as long as we need to, and we're going to win. Um, and the result, as a result, the impact on the people on the ground was completely different in Iraq than it was in Afghanistan. And I was there to see both of those uh, instances. In Iraq, um, everyone realized we were getting back out into the communities. We were applying lots of force. We were there to stay. We were there to win. And we, we got people to side with us. The Awakening Movement, the Sons of Iraq, they realized that um, we were the strongest tribe in Iraq and, and uh, they could use us and ally with us against uh, the people they, they saw as their, uh, their desperately or, um, uh, violent enemies, Al-Qaeda in Iraq primarily, but also the Shiite government in Baghdad. They wanted us to intercede with the government for them, which we did. In Afghanistan, I got there on the ground, and um, we got to talking with the locals, and you could just see the reticence to support anything we were doing. There was no equivalent to the awakening movement in Afghanistan. Um, the people were on the sidelines at best and neutral, neutral at best and pro-Taliban sympathizers at worst. And although some did support our efforts there and the efforts of their government, it was a, a, an uphill battle all the way. And part of it was this, this psychological impact of announcing the withdrawal uh, of the surge forces before they had even gotten on the ground. Uh, nevertheless, the surge did in Afghanistan did um, a lot of good. It brought uh, more than 90% of Afghanistan under the control of, of uh, the central government. Uh, but then we entered the fourth phase of the war, and that was from 2012 to the 2016, mid-2017. And that was the withdrawal phase. And as uh, U.S. and NATO forces uh, drew down, all the way down to 8,000 troops for the United States, the Taliban made a comeback. And uh, even though the Afghan government was under more capable hands of Ashraf Ghani, um, it was not strong enough to uh, withstand uh, the Taliban surge, the Taliban fighting. Um, let me go back and just say that the... Um, third phase of the war, the surge was, I think the high point of that obviously was um, the raid to capture and kill bin Laden. And that sort of ended that, that phase. Uh, as we drew down in the fourth phase though, uh, the Afghan forces were not uh, numerous enough nor tra well trained enough uh, to pick up the slack. And so we are where we are today 
with the Taliban controlling about 40% of the country and um, looking to be, again, an unstoppable force, sort of back to where stage two was uh, a decade ago. And now we're going to enter stage five, which is uh, the Trump administration's uh, move back into support of the Afghan government in a more uh, robust manner. I think they're going to try to apply the the model used to uh, defeat ISIS in Iraq, uh, in Afghanistan, that is uh, more U.S. advisors, lots of uh, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance assets, um, lots of air power advisors lo at lower levels to advise and assist the uh, Afghan security forces, even out in the field, out in active operations, and to uh, try to increase uh, maybe double or triple the numbers of Afghan special forces. And uh, what we found out in Iraq is that the total number of troops in a military doesn't matter as much as those who are really well trained and can fight. And most of the fighting in Mosul and the other places are the Iraqi special forces. And so we're going to try to apply that model, I think, to Afghanistan. And uh, we'll see where that leads us in uh, the months and years ahead. So that's the war in a snapshot. I would say we're still there because of 9-11. We're still there because we don't want the Taliban to create a safe haven for al-Qaeda. Uh, we're still there because Pakistan is uh, giving refuge to al-Qaeda and to, to the Taliban on its soil. Pakistan remains uh, what we would call a, a frenemy, a friend and an enemy. We uh, are one of its biggest suppliers of military hardware and and aid, and yet at the same time, they aid and assist uh, forces that are uh, fighting against us next door. So, very complicated situation, and uh, I think in the rest of the uh, time we have uh, available, we'll try to unpack it for you. All right. Thank you very much, Pete. Uh, I am happy then to start entertaining questions from the floor. Um, uh, so please don't be shy. Uh, go ahead and, and raise your hand. Uh, at the same time, I have come. Of course, come actually, I have a question for you. Oh, yeah. you are <laughs> See, I've come person. armed with, a, with, yes. with my own list of hardballs. And that is, but... was my characterization of the history of the Afghan government and, uh, and the, the, I think the failure of the lawyer Jurga to produce a, an adequate form of government uh, in Afghanistan, do you agree with that, or would you actually? Would you... I have to say, I kind of don't. Yeah. Uh, and I, I've made a note here. I wanted to. I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, in my view, um, the Loya Jirga was a natural move. It's a very Afghan institution. It's like a, a parliament, right? Everybody has representatives. Lots of voices are there to be to be heard, and it's a, an institution that exists at the local level across Afghanistan. But the um, my uh, looking to my the students in my history of Afghanistan course. This is on. This is after the midterm. Okay, so you don't have to. The, <laughs> they got the midterm coming up next week. Uh, but this is what we're going to see. This is a little bit of um, uh, foreshadowing for what, what you're going to find, which is that the story of the 20th century in Afghanistan is one of slow, gradual progress institutional infrastructures being built, educational infrastructures being built, uh, international uh, business interests being established, honored rule of law, and a slow, gradual expansion of Kabul across the country. It doesn't happen quickly. It's very, very slow. And there are instances when particular rulers in Kabul tried to exert too much authority too quickly and upset this delicate balance. And the question, the, 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 this tension that exists in, Af in Afghan society, and here's a, another issue that maybe we can, we can discuss as a, as a group, is um, uh, drawing a distinction between Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, Afghanistan is um, at, the, the, at the lowest common denominator. If you remove Kabul, if you remove the United States, you've got uh, you remove Pakistan, you remove Iran, and, and um, Uzbekistan is really not much of a player on the, on the ground these days. You have local government. You have people who are accustomed to dealing with their own, they're self-adjudicating, they're, they're taking care of their own legal problems, their own legal issues. And they're very, very skeptical of outside forces. Um, and this is a generalization, I'm speaking in, a, in, in, in general terms. 
uh, but it is something that is applicable across non-urban Afghanistan, which is where we see the fighters for the Taliban come, so many of them. Uh, and it's a tension that needs to be folded into our understanding of um, my first question for you, see, I'll volley right back to you, uh, which is, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reread the topic uh, of today's dialogue. Across generational conflict, continuing American involvement in Afghanistan. Afghanistan is, as you say, it's our nation's longest war. Um, We've had our own troops on the ground since 2001, but we have actually been involved indirectly since the early years of the Soviet invasion, which began, uh, was it Christmas Eve 1979, right? The Soviet invasion as the Soviet tanks went across the so ironically titled Bridge of Friendship from Uzbekistan into, um, uh, down toward Mazar-i Sharif, uh, and occupied with more than 110,000 Soviet troops. Um, We've been there supporting since shortly after that. We, um, uh, it was just a, a year or two after that we started siphoning some, uh, some, some resources into supporting the Mujahideen efforts against the Soviets. And then with uh, Charlie Wilson, it's a great movie if you haven't seen it, a Hollywood thing, but it's, it's still great an enjoyable too, watch. Yeah. It, it really is. Um, uh, we pumped huge amounts of money into Afghanistan to support the Mujahideen. So, um, you briefly mentioned it, and I'd, I'd ask you to, to maybe expand on your answer. Why are we still there? And, and, and that's not a critical. I, th I think we, we should be. But uh, I, I, let's talk about why we are still there. I mean, that's an important question for us to, to address. And second, and no less important, is what does victory look like in this place? What does a victory in Afghanistan look like? Right? Is it a McDonald's on every corner, um, a Starbucks inside that McDonald's, or is it something else? What, is, what does victory look like? Well, in, in um, talking about Afghanistan as a cross-generational conflict, I'm reminded of the, uh, there's an army, kind of a spoof site called Duffel Blog. It's kind of like the onion for army people. And one of the uh, headlines recently read, um, infantry soldier honored to take over his father's patrol route in Afghanistan. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, so why are we still there? Um, well, one, we don't want Afghanistan to become a base for terror again. Now, we, there are people who say, well, we could get out, allow it to fall to the Taliban, and just read them the riot act if they allow terror to emanate from there again. We're going to come in and do it to you again. But I think that's a very kind of expensive proposition, and they may call our, our bluff on it. I think... Uh, there's another reason, though, and that is, you know, one of the things the surge in Iraq did is it, it, it dealt a blow to al-Qaeda's brand. There's a reason you don't have an organization called al-Qaeda in Iraq anymore, because we defeated it during the surge, and they had to rebrand themselves as something else, because no one likes to side with a loser. And they became the Islamic State of Iraq and al-Sham instead. Um, the same thing can happen in Afghanistan in, re in reverse. If somehow the Taliban were to succeed in winning, their narrative would go something like this. We, we have defeated not one, but two superpowers in the Hindu Kush. We defeated the Soviets, and now we defeated the Americans, and raised the banner of jihad across the world. We're on the march. And it could actually energize al-Qaeda, which um, doesn't need any energizing and um, it could create even more problems for us than we have today. So what, what does victory look like there? Um, it certainly won't come fast, probably won't come very cheaply, uh, but it can come. But it has to be a long-term commitment to the security of Afghanistan. Uh, in Iraq, George Bush used to say that he wanted Iraq to look like South Korea. What does that mean? Well, we're 65 years after the Korean War. We have 30,000 troops in South Korea. Americans aren't complaining about that. There's no casualties. Uh, South Korea has become uh, an Asian tiger, an economy that uh, melds well with ours, a, de a vibrant democracy, but it took several decades to get there. And that was his view of Iraq. I think that's probably the, the best long-term case for Afghanistan as well, that it becomes a, a U.S. ally in Central Asia or remains a U.S. ally, that it slowly over time develops 
um, its society uh, to become less warlike and that we, over time, with U.S. support, is able to defeat the Taliban. And only when you convince the Taliban that they cannot win will they consider negotiating a peace, and not until then. This is the fallacy of people who say, oh, negotiations are the solution. Negotiations are not the solution until both sides are willing to negotiate. What makes both sides willing to negotiate? Either, either mutual uh, fear that they'll lose out if they don't, or mutual appreciation that they have more to gain by negotiating than by continuing the fight. And right now, the Taliban believes it has more to gain by continuing the fight than to negotiate. And so there will be no negotiated uh, peace in Afghanistan until the government in Kabul can prove that it can stand up on its own two feet for the long haul, and it can only do that with U.S. assistance. Uh, this touches on a point that Ashraf Ghani uh, made not too long ago, um, which is um, what kind of assistance? We um, uh, are accustomed to thinking in, in the public sphere, we think about assistance in terms of it being aid, right, an aid package. We're going to send technology. We're going to send people to help install that technology. We're going to build roads. We're going to build schools, and we'll buy books, and we'll stock those schools with books, and um, this, is, this is aid. Uh, but Ashraf Ghani makes the point he doesn't want aid. Uh, what does he want? What he, and Ashraf Ghani, is, he's an interesting character. Um, he's been marginally successful. Um, he's a different, in, in many ways, than Hamid Karzai, who is much more a politician. Ashraf Ghani has his PhD in anthropology. Um, he taught at uh, UC Berkeley and at Johns Hopkins uh, before um, uh, uh, Hamid Karzai tapped him. He had some, some positions with uh, the... Um, uh, monetary fund, international IMF, international monetary fund as well, but then became the finance minister for Afghanistan. So he's a he's an economist. Uh, he's also an anthropologist, um, and uh, I mean he's he's really an intellectual. He came in as kind of the darling of the West. Everybody thought if you put Ashraf Ghani in, that'll be great. There's somebody who really understands. I mean he graduated from high school in Oregon, right? Um, how many other Afghan guys graduated from Oregon in 1967? Uh, you know, maybe, maybe. Well, if there was any other family members, that would that would probably be it. Um, but his point is that aid is um, it's a short-term fix to a long-term problem. What they need is business. They need business interests. They need companies to come in and say, uh, you know, Afghan uh, people are the best at X jewelry making, um, fine arts. Um, producing opium. <laughs> produ they excel at producing opium. And this actually goes to the point that he's trying to make, is how do you undermine the opium economy and the mafia that runs it, which completely undermines his ability to actually govern as, a, as, as the, the executive uh, authority figure in Afghanistan, as the president of Afghanistan. You have to have businesses for people to actually operate. Or... The alternative is you pump money in an aid and you have a very, as I said before, a very skeptical population when groups like the United States come in and build a road. It's assumed that this road is going to facilitate the central government's reach into that region. And the central government since the 1970s has been an extractive institution that um, is more interested in... Uh, Feathering its own pockets. Feathering its own pockets, I was going to say, ex the most exploiting. On the earth that's right. One of the two. Yeah, then, then providing you know, peace and security and justice. Right? So there's the, a, a road is not necessarily seen as a good thing, but a job is. And um, I would just kind of throw that out there for us to think about. This is when we talk about what victory looks like. It's not our corporation setting up shop, it's not um, us building a school for them, it's a partnership. And it's not just the United States. It has to be a global affair. Trust is a very difficult thing to earn. And when we think of recent Afghan history, um, you've got, since 1979, um, you have had a steady string of wars. I mean, you, you outlined in greater detail than I could the more, recent, uh, the more recent wars. But the Soviet invasion lasted 10 full years. Um, 
followed by a civil war that was raging when, when I was living in Pakistan and then Uzbekistan in the 1990s. And then we went straight into 2001. Um, you've got how much, what percentage of the population that has never known peace, stability, and security? How do we build that trust? And I think that's a, I, I would argue that's a factor that has to be considered in, um, uh, in our vision for, for, for what, uh, what victory looks like. A, a, an environment that, um, uh, that encourages, that, uh, um, uh, that supports, that it's hard, it's hard to get trust. There, hard to get there without security, though. You can't. John You're Paul right. Van, a uh, famous U.S. advisor in Vietnam who died uh, there in combat, once famously said, I don't know uh, if the first 80% of counterinsurgency operations is security or whether 20% of counterinsurgency operations is security. What I do know is that the first 80% or the first 20% is security because without security you can't have development. Yep. That's right. That's right. You can't set up a factory offer people jobs and then have somebody from the Taliban who doesn't understand and is skeptical just come in and blow up that factory and expect somebody to come in and build another one. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Security has to go hand in hand with any solution as well. We should go out there? Yeah. Questions? Yeah, you know, please. Sir. In Pakistan's eyes, okay. in Pakistan's eyes, gotcha. okay. because that's when they felt most secure. They had the Taliban government, which was amenable to their interests in charge. Could we have could we have used the king uh, and the king's That's influence really differently? You, um, it may have been possible, um, but uh, and you know I actually have a, a, a colleague who would have advocated for just that move, um, but of course he's a member of the royal family, <laughs> so <laughs> doesn't have a vested interest. Um, I hope he's not watching on Facebook right now, <laughs> but. Um, uh, at that point in time, the king had, um, I mean, the king was, was very aged. The king has since passed away. Uh, king Zayed Shah was um, uh, deposed in a communist coup. Um, much of, as you had, had, had correctly observed, much of the, the global community refused to recognize the validity of this coup. And so among many in the, in the global community, the king did still have legitimacy. Um, it's possible that, uh, that we could have used the... Um, uh, the Durrani dynasty is uh, as an anchor in, in building a different form of stability, but that would have steered us in a direction that we did not seem predisposed to go. That would have required setting up something akin to a monarch, and maybe not even a constitutional monarch, but a monarch that was going to be vested with the authority, really, to force the territories of Afghanistan back under Kabul control. I have a couple of comments on that. One is uh, you, would, you would have had the same problem that you had with uh, Hamid Karzai. 
and that is um, the warlords who had assumed power in the intervening period were still there, and someone had to bring them under control. And whether it was an electri uh, elected president or a um, or an unelected monarch, you have the same security problem there with the warlords and with the Taliban. Um, so that was the first thing. The second thing is that remember that George W. Bush administration's policy was um, the advancement of democracies around the world, and so you would have had to have. I think needed a different president in charge in the United States because he can't at one set one on the one hand say democracy is the answer to everyone's problems and the other other hand say well the first nation that we invade and can do something with we're not going to do a democ have a democracy there so uh, for a couple of reasons I think unworkable although interesting we invite other questions from the audience please don't be shy so uh, thinking about uh, President Trump's new uh, announced strategy, one of the things that stood out to me is that he seems to want to take a slightly different uh, tact on Pakistan's role on the issue. Um, so I had a question for each of you about how you thought that might play out. So Professor Mansour, you were talking about how uh, Pakistan supports a lot of the terrorist uh, movements in Afghanistan. My understanding of that is that that's more on the side of the military rather than the civilian government, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, so from, from your unique perspective, I was wondering what you think um, in terms of military to military talks, um, we might be able to do more to uh, pressure Pakistan to ratchet down that support of the, the terrorist networks, um, and also what, the, what we're doing now, um, if anything, just what's the situation with our military to military relationship with Pakistan. And uh, Professor Levi, I was wondering, um, he also mentioned that he would like to see India step up its economic engagement with Afghanistan, um, which I think would uh, kind of ruffle some feathers with Pakistan. Um, so I'm wondering if you think, what do you, what do you think the strategy was there in sort of raising that issue, and if you think that that was a, a wise choice? I, I think you've answered your own question, because uh, the issue with Pakistan has always been, well, we need to pressure them to stop supporting the Haqqani network and the Taliban, but how, how to go about doing that when we're reliant on them for lines of communication and, um, and we, they're a nuclear armed state, we don't want them to become an enemy. Uh, and what they want is security, right? So they want an Afghanistan that's pliable to their, their interests and needs and wants, and yet our national interest lies more with a India that's an ally against potentially China um, than with Pakistan as an ally. And you can't have it both ways. You can't say, well, we're going to do more in terms of making India, embracing India, making them an ally, which he said in his speech. And on the other hand, tell Pakistan to stop interfering in Afghanistan, which they view as, like I said, an Indian plot to surround them. Um, so this is really, really difficult. And although he said all the right words about we're going to pressure Pakistan, they need to stop playing the double dick game and everything. How to do it, uh, no one's been able to solve that puzzle yet. That's right. And just it, briefly to respond to your question, which I, I nicely informed question. Um, I have absolutely no doubt that there are no shortage of Indian entrepreneurs who would love to crack into Afghan markets, but it goes back to the same issue that uh, Dr. Mansour was, was mentioning earlier, security. Um, if we can have a secure environment, there is no shortage of investment capital that could come out of Delhi, Mumbai, and uh, especially down in, the, in Hyderabad and the Deccan and you know the, the, the tech centers. All I mean, the, a, a, an immense array of types of projects that could make their way into Afghanistan, mm -hmm. but it doesn't work without security. Um, and uh, just to reiterate a point that you were you were making, um, and, and I think that you recognize, uh, it's really difficult to speak of one Pakistani program, one Pakistani um, objective, goal, initiative vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan. Uh, there is the government, of course. But within the government, you have people who are charged with carrying out one particular governmental policy coming straight out of Islamabad, but on the side, support a different policy. And it's, 
how do we make sense of that? It's, um, uh, it's an issue of corruption, and it's, um, it creates an environment that makes it very, very difficult to, um, uh, to, to deal with through diplomacy. Right, so the Russians obviously had a far different operating concept than, than we did. Um, their their uh, conception of counterinsurgency was more like the Romans go in and kill everyone in the tribe and call the area pacified. Uh, and they did create, uh, what, 7 million refugees from the Afghan people, killed another 2 or 3 million. Um, they were very brutal. I think that we have a feeling that we can uh, do better get the people actually decide with their own central government that we're supporting. And that would be um, then set us up for a, a long-term relationship with Afghanistan, not as occupier, not as colonial overlord, but as a friend and ally. Um, now, I think the long, in the long term, it, the solution has to be some sort of political deal where the Taliban will come to terms with um, an Afghanistan that they don't control. They may be part of, uh, kind of like uh, Hezbollah in, in Lebanon is part of that government, uh, but they don't control the, the country. And um, I don't think that'll, that can happen until they, they are shown that they cannot win. To, to go into Afghanistan, it was a communist coup that put the government in charge, uh, in, in control of a communist uh, government, the Communist Party. During the, um, the Cold War, uh, as the U.S. was choosing our allies and the Soviets were choosing their allies, uh, the Soviets pumped enormous amounts of money, technology, and, and um, placed their own people on the ground across Afghanistan. So they were, uh, by, by, by give, gifting technology, what they were essentially doing was turning Afghanistan into a client state. And then they took it to the next step and they supported the communist coup. And the communist coup looked like it was going to fail. It um, actually it was it was teetering. It was all but done, uh, and then the Soviets came in to support their, uh, in their view, as they following their spin, rightly elected communist leaders of uh, of Afghanistan, right? Um, so, I mean, that's the the nuts and bolts of what drew them in. You know, I I, I think you make a good point. When the British withdrew from Afghanistan in the 19th century, Afghanistan was sort of, in, you know, isolated. It was, in, it was there. It, it didn't have a lot of influence on uh, external events. And if we could be sure that that would be the case again, then I'd say withdraw tomorrow. Um, but we're but living in a different world now. We live in a completely different yeah. world. And I think, uh, like I said, the narrative of the jihadist groups would change. They'd be energized again. We don't know what the Taliban would do in terms of uh, giving sucker to them in the future. Um, so I... To me, it's worth the, uh, the investment of our uh, resources to see Afghanistan through to a successful conclusion. And, and that means uh, the ability to stay there for the long term. And that means reducing casualties, which we've already done, and reducing the cost, uh, which, you know, we need to do. The question of the Taliban is a, I mean, that's a, that's a very important one. Um, can there be a Taliban in the future of Afghanistan? Right. Is there a role for the Taliban in a future, stable um, uh, you know, Afghan society? I, I think there is if they come to that uh, agreement not to take up force of arms against the government. Look at the FARC in Colombia. Right. Who would have thought that they would ever become part of the Colombian government, and yet they'd given no, up that's their a, arms? That's a good example. But it's taken that's 30 or 40 years for, for them to realize we're not going to win, and we're all yeah. getting old, and you know we'd like to see something out of our efforts. <laughs> 
Uh, Dale. Um, I agree that Alabama will probably be part of the final solution. You know, they agree to have a lesser role in the Afghan government. But my question is, what in state would we accept from Afghanistan security aside? For example, um, if in the Ashton area of Afghanistan they say that they close our phone to foreign would they accept that? I think we would. If that's what the Afghan people want, I think we would. And be a tragedy for the, the female population of that part of Afghanistan, but it would be better than keeping the Taliban as an enemy of the United States. What about the Iranians? What role do they play in the future of Afghanistan? Right next door, there's a lot of influence. Yeah, and, and they are, um, by some accounts, supporting the Taliban because the enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? Um, they clearly are, they play a role, um, as are the Russians and others who would like to see us um, taken down in Afghanistan. But I think uh, in terms of vis-a-vis -vis Iran, our, our national interests are more deeply embedded in the Middle East, especially in Iraq, uh, where we meet Iran head on <laughs> almost every day. In, um, uh, in, in, a, in the Afghan arena, I think the Russians and the Iranians' greatest interest is to see us fail. And they'll continue to pump resources in. If they see that agenda, if it, that it's advancing that agenda, they'll continue to pump their resources. Every dollar, every um, uh, ruble, whatever, choose your currency, is worth ten times that value in terms of what it costs us. Uh, and so they'll continue to do it. And it's the, the very much the same game that we played against the Soviets in the 1980s, right? Um, it is a very effective technique. Uh, the ultimate losers, of course, are the Afghans, right? Yeah. Uh, question. Do you think that under Trump's, President Trump's new plan, it would be a better idea to use special forces and air power similar to what we're doing by ISIS, like you said earlier, or do you think that we should use, like we did at the beginning of the Iraq War, more conventional forces first, that just locate them, locate all their bases, find them, then use our conventional forces or anything we should do more. I think we're beyond um, an industrial strength counterinsurgency at this point. It would be too expensive, and the American people wouldn't support it. So regardless of what we think would be more effective, we're, we're going to default to sort of the the war against ISIS model, where we have, you know, in Iraq, I think we have about six, 8,000 troops, same amount in Syria, and they're, uh, they're doing advisory missions. They're, they have very robust air power on call and uh, training up uh, elite, the elite portions of, uh, of the Iraqi and um, of the Iraqi army, and, and I think that'll be the case in Afghanistan as well. And they, uh, look, the Iraqi uh, Special Forces have done great work. They've cleared out uh, Fallujah, Ramadi, uh, Tikrit, uh, now Mosul, Tel Afar. That's a pretty good record um, for a pretty small force. And I think that's the hope that we can replicate that success in Afghanistan. In terms of where the Taliban bases are, unfortunately, we know where they are. They're across the border in Pakistan, and we can't do anything about them. This is the biggest issue. If we can convince Pakistan to stop their support of the Taliban and, um, and to actually aid us in ejecting them from the country, that would be another path to uh, a political solution because the Taliban, I don't think, can survive without those external bases. I, I haven't heard that they have trouble recruiting replacements. I, I, they have been taking large losses, um, but I haven't heard anything that they're having trouble filling the ranks. 
Um, so I don't know. I don't know anything more than that. Uh, with a more robust advisory effort, we can make those forces more capable. They're taking a lot of losses now because they're not very well trained, unfortunately. And, um, and the enemy has the advantage in that he can be unseen, right? He can wear civilian clothes. He can, it's the war of the guerrilla ambush and now suicide bombers and so forth. It's, it's easier to cause casualties as the guerrilla than, than vice versa unless you have very good intelligence. And you talk about putting in conventional forces to find out where the enemy is like we did during the surge. We need to do that in Afghanistan, but they need to be Afghan conventional forces. And it's going to take years to build up their forces to the point where they are capable of doing that. There was a question over here. The Yankee fan in the corner. The first part is you discussed kind of the support of the Afghan people under the initial advance of us in Afghanistan, that they were somewhat in support of it. And then the second, when we started to withdraw and whatnot, they said that you know, they weren't on the side because they wanted to be on the winning side of things. How do the people uh, see it now that Trump has kind of um, reinvigorated our uh, efforts there? And then the second part is um, somewhat about what you were maybe talking about, where, where they're being, people are recruited from the countryside. A lot has been made about the recruiting tactics of ISIS. What are the uh, recruiting tactics of the Taliban and the Okay, on the, um, uh, whether the people were with us or, or whatnot, initially, um, the Northern Alliance, the people that supported the Northern Alliance, the Uzbeks, uh, the, the Tajiks, the uh, Hazaras, am I getting them all right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, they were, they were overjoyed. Uh, the, the, the Pashtuns, you know, it was a mixed bag. Uh, although Hamid Karzai was a Pashtun himself, uh, there were Pashtuns that supported the Taliban. There were a lot that were simply on the on, neutral. They, you know, wanted to live their own lives and run their own communities and didn't have much use for Kabul. Um, as the Taliban made a comeback, um, you know, the, the people swing sort of back and forth. Uh, pretty much, they just want to survive. Um, now, whether the Afghan people would ever fully get behind the, their own government, um, I think that will only come once there's a, uh, some sort of a negotiated political solution to the conflict. And this is a conflict that's been going on since 1979. And um, Afghanistan, we've had two generations grow up knowing nothing but war. Uh, and the only way to stop it is to stop the violence. It was the same way that the only way the surge was going to work was to stop the violence in Iraq. And we were able to do it there, but it cost us, you know, it was a huge effort. 160,000 American troops, 20,000 ally troops, 360,000 Iraqi you know, security forces. I mean, it was an effort that was all in. We're not going to get that effort in Afghanistan, which means if you if you don't have that many, that much resources, it's going to just going to take a longer period of time to do it. And, um, you know, we'll see where it heads. So uh, the Afghan people will eventually side with whoever can promise them a better way of life and security. I think that's the answer. Uh, and just briefly in response to your question about recruiting tactics, uh, let me just say that the Taliban tactics... Uh, have in the past been no less brutal than ISIS, okay? Um, uh, certainly there are multiple reasons why people might join up, why somebody, you know, a disaffected youth may join such a movement or um, uh, why they may respond to financial incentives as well. Uh, but um, recruiting children, kidnapping children, uh, this, this is par for the course as well. Additional questions? From the, from the floor. 
Well, think about that. I have a, I have, I have one that um, uh, that that I'll throw your way first. Uh, this is kind of one we, you you started talking about when um, when you were giving your introductory remarks. But I'd like to to touch back on this a, a, a bit now that we've had a chance to to flesh things out a bit. Um, General H. R. McMaster um, is in charge of our current strategy in Afghanistan. Um, you served alongside him on the Joint Chiefs Council of Colonels, I, I believe, right? Uh, and, um, and during the surge, he was part of General Petraeus' staff, excellent. Uh, which I helped put together. Mm -hmm. uh, your criticism of um, the president is a matter of public record, and that one can find in the, the dispatch.com. Uh, but um, uh, I also know that um, you view um, H.R. McMaster considerably more favorably. Um, how would you evaluate the strategy that he's applying, or that he's trying to apply right now? Yeah, you know, you could tell it was HR's strategy when President Trump was making his speech about Afghanistan, and it was like um, he had a bar of soap in his mouth, and the school teacher, <laughs> you know, had, had been taking him to task and was making him read this speech as a result. Uh, uh, it was clearly uh, not his words. It was uh, McMaster and Mattis's words, and I think it's about the best strategy that you can come up with. The alternative to this, I think, is total withdrawal and just cut our losses and let Afghanistan probably fall and deal with the aftermath, which could might not be pretty, but that would be the alternative. You can't really surge again, uh, massive amounts of forces. Uh, you, you, you couldn't keep 8,000 there and keep the place from falling apart. We've already proven that as it was falling apart. And so it was either add more troops, change what they were doing, provide more air power, um, put more pressure on the Taliban over time, uh, and then uh, and on the same realm, put more pressure on pa Pakistan. How they're doing that is a mystery, but uh, he said it at least. Mm -hmm. um, or just basically, as the Russians did in 1989, say our, our time... In, is over and in Afghanistan is over and good luck. Um, and I don't think that would have been very good luck. I think uh, no. I don't know that the government would have survived. No. Let me um, let me say I don't think that failure really should be considered an option. Um, so the what happens? Of foreign policy. <laughs> <laughs> what happens if Afghanistan turns into a vacuum? What uh, what do we face? Um, we know. Uh, to, to a great extent, that it will be a magnet for groups and individuals who would like to be parts of groups who would very much like to unleash terror in a variety of different capacities uh, around the world. And whether that is in Russia, it, for example, Chechnya, or Moscow, Petersburg, some school uh, yet again, or a, a theater, as, as has happened, uh, in Manhattan, as we've seen, um, in Israel, in you name it, um, in New Delhi, um, all of these, all of us, we're all, we're, we're all part of this together. We're all part of this world. And if we leave Afghanistan fragmented, uh, and you can feel free to, to disagree with me, I think we will confront the same forms of terror that we have grown so familiar with. Well, I think it would become ungoverned space. And wherever you have ungoverned space, you have terrorist groups and you have Warfare, Libya, Yemen, Somalia, Afghanistan, you know, the list, the list goes Syria, yeah. the list goes on. Um, ungoverned space is not good for the nation state system in the world today. And the less of it we can have, I think, the better. I agree. Additional question? Please don't be shy. Yes. So, Professor Rinser, you were uh, talking in your opening remarks about the complicated web of. Uh, the NATO mission um, in Afghanistan and how it just complicates everything. Do you have any suggestions for ways to reform that and make everything more clear? More Actually, clear? General Petraeus did reform it a great deal. Um, <clears throat> but look at what, uh, what he was facing. He had a U.S. command. He had United States troops under a NATO command with a rotating commander uh, from different nations. Um, in the, the NATO force, I'm not sure how many NATO nations provided troops, but more than a dozen, I would say. And they all had national caveats on how their troops could be used. 
And so when you were planning an operation, you had to figure out, well, is it a U.S. operation? Is it a NATO operation? If it's a NATO operation, how can we use each of the individual components that these na national troops have provided us within the rules of engagement that their government has set? It was a mess. And um, he cleaned it up as much as he could, rationalized it, but you still have those national caveats. And that's just a function of uh, alliance politics. There's no way around around those. I, I've written a book on, or edited a, a book on grand strategy military alliances. And although alliances are difficult to deal with, uh, what Churchill said, I think, is applicable. The only thing worse than fighting with allies is fighting without them. <laughs> the... Um... Uh, democracy is the worst form of government, save all the others, right? That's a, <laughs> and and Americans will eventually do the right thing after exhausting all the alternatives. They get a couple of historians together and we'll, we can go <laughs> like this course. all day. <laughs> um, uh, uh, another question from the floor? Sir. Yeah, you, you use Iraq as a reference point here. And um, Iraq is oil. How about Afghanistan? Does Afghanistan have something valuable? Afghanistan has minerals, uh, lots of them, but uh, it's going to require a lot of development to get at them. Uh, but they, they potentially um, have great mineral resources. Obviously, they've got farmland. <laughs> they grow a lot of o opium poppies today, if that could be pr put to more productive uses. Uh, well, not just opium. They grow cannabis for marijuana also. <laughs> that actually may be legalized in the United States soon, so that could be an export crop. Um, they have a young population, so they, they have workers. Um, and a lot of them are being exported to Europe illegally, basically, as, as, as refugees and migrants. Um, you see this with a lot of these uh, nations where their economy is not very vibrant, but they have a lot of young people. Co Kosovars are moving into Europe, uh, Syrians. And I think <clears throat> um, if Europe could actually get over the, the cultural issue of having more Muslims in, the, in their midst, the, the injection of youth into their societies would act, and their economies would actually be a good thing, but that's a big if. I'll just add to that, um, uh, the minerals are an extraordinarily important resource. And as it stands, China has been at the forefront of working to access those, negotiating with the government in Kabul to gain access to those for a fraction of what they're worth. Uh, and there, of course, we have the security issues that have to be factored in to the total cost. Um, but there are other handicraft skills that uh, Afghans are, are fantastic at. Uh, so textile industry would be a natural fit for, for, for Afghanistan. And I don't mean, you know, growing cotton. I mean making textiles, building factories. And uh, uh, jewelry making, of course, goes with, goes with this as well. Um, taking the stones from, uh, from their own soil and then marketing those on the international market. So there are, there are ways, there are, there are avenues. Um, uh, but security comes first. Um, one more point that, well, as a, as a historian, let me ask you, um, there, one of the great powers that historians have, one of our many, one of our many great powers, um, uh, is that we can be in all places at all times, right, as we're looking in the past. Uh, we can see how things unfolded. We have the benefit of hindsight. And let me ask you, Pete, to do a little bit of uh, Monday morning quarterbacking as the, you know, both the retired colonel and also the professional historian. It's the Gandalf of historians. <laughs> there you go. Magical. There you go. Um, what do you think we have done most wrong? Pick two or three. What do you think have been our biggest blunders in Afghanistan? Uh, I, I think uh, the, the biggest blunder was the Battle of Tora Bora in, um, I think it was November, December of 01. Yeah. We had Al-Qaeda on the run, and we knew they were going to try to escape. And we didn't use U.S. combat forces to block their way. General Mattis was on the ground uh, as a brigade commander at the time, one-star general, and he offered his, to use his Marines to block the pass from Tora Bora back into Pakistan, knowing that a lot of Marines would get killed, but also knowing that this was 
the mission to capture bin Laden, destroy Al Qaeda, and instead um, the the commander there in Afghanistan at the time decided um, not to do that, to use local Afghan militia who really had no vested interest in, in uh, losing people to destroy Al Qaeda, and, and Al Qaeda and bin Laden escaped into Pakistan. So that was, I think, the, the primary issue. Because had we destroyed Al Qaeda then, one, they wouldn't be around today, or they might be around in a much more reduced form. We, we wouldn't have had another 10 years of hunting for bin Laden. And um, possible that uh, it would have uh, um, uh, meant the death knell for the Taliban as well. <clears throat> um, so that's the first. I think the second in my view, was um, the way we executed the surge in 2009, 2010, 2011. And not execution on the ground, I mean political execution, the high-level strategic execution. Um, I think Barack Obama made an enormous mistake in, in announcing a deadline, a, a withdrawal deadline at the same time that he announced the surge. If you're going to do that, don't even surge in the first place, because all they're going to do is wait you out. And had he not done that, what I saw on the ground in December 2010 was very heartening. Our troops were even be better trained because they, they had taken the lessons from the surge in Iraq. They were applying them on the ground in places like the Ergandab Valley. And they were very, very effective tactically and operationally. I think we had a good plan to extend the surge from Helmand and Kandahar to the north and east and eventually face off against the Haqqani network east of Jalalabad. And had we had more time and more support um, I think that would have worked, and that would have been another place at which you might have been able to, to force the Taliban into negotiations. So there's two. I'm trying to think of a third. A third probably would be in uh, Barack Obama's uh, decision to um, withdraw uh, all the way down to 8,000 troops. It's simply not enough to do more than guard yourself. And so um, had he kept 15,000, 20,000 on the ground, um, transitioned from what we were doing, which was a partially resourced counterinsurgency effort, into a full-blown advisory, uh, advise and assist mission with plenty of air power, I think uh, we wouldn't be in the situation, the Taliban wouldn't have made the big comeback that they have had in uh, the past couple of years. And we wouldn't have had to make reverse course yet again now with the, the Trump administration. So there's okay. the... All right, thank you. Uh, let me now say we have reached 6.55, so I have time for exactly one final question. Okay. And there, we, the hand went up right away. Excellent. All right. <laughs> Um, I think they're good if we maintain the national will to remain engaged. I think they were, like in Iraq, I thought they were great had we retained the national will to remain engaged. Um, if we don't and, uh, and we withdraw, then obviously, as we've discussed, Afghanistan will fall apart and become an ungoverned space. Um, but I think the United States can succeed. We, we've got to stop wringing our hands um, and realize that some of these commitments have to be long-term if we want to see them through to the end, a successful end. And hopefully with partnerships, again, following Churchill's <laughs> advice. All right. Well, with that, uh, I want to say thank you very much to Pete Mansour, and thank you to all of you.